Did he say to you, if you, or did you ask him for money? Did you ask him for money for that letter of recommendation? Absolutely not. I have never in my life asked any constituent, any developer, anybody for money to do my job. I always felt it was an honor that you even consider my community because we need so much help over here. I've never had a conversation with him about money before or after. I never had conversations with Lewis Reed about anything. I never had conversation with John Carlos Muhammad about anything. Matter of fact, I am very disappointed to hear that John Collins Muhammad got $1,000 for making an introduction to me. That's the kind of stuff that bothered me about being a politician. And I always told myself I would never be the type of politician that would hustle people. Because I, for number one, they could walk away. Why would you want to do that and just run people away? And I said, I would never, ever do that. Now, I sit here today looking like a corrupt politician, somebody I despised that I said would never be me. So he calls me after he gets his paperwork from LRA and he talks about, oh, you know, I would have never had this. This couldn't be done without you and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, okay. I said, well, you know, that's what a good alderman does. You know, you know, I didn't hesitate. I, you know, went to bat for you. That's what I do. And so he went to hand me some money. And I was like, oh, no, you ain't got to worry about that. And he said, I said, trust me, it's okay. I didn't need his money, you know. And I didn't want him to think I was that type of guy that you got to pay me to do anything. And so just not thinking that anything was wrong with it because I was doing the car business with him. He wouldn't let me pay for the cars. I'm thinking this guy really cares about me. Um, he gave me access to his Carfax. He taught me how to you know, look at Carfax and, and, and really buy a car without losing all the money. I mean, this guy I felt was mentoring me. I would have never in a million years at that time thought that this guy was setting me up. And so, I took the money and I cannot say that I did not do what's wrong because when I look at the tape and when I look at what's presented to me and I look at the law, even though I didn't take it that way when it happened, I took the money. And it all boils down to when I keep telling everybody, I never asked for anything. I didn't want it. They say, yeah, Jeffrey, we know, but you took the money. Why did you take the money? I kind of felt like I was insulting him if I didn't because he kept saying, it's okay, it's okay, you know, here, 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 and, and not thinking. I was not the original Jeffrey Boyd that I, that I would normally be. I'm telling you, flat out honestly, I was just going through motions and doing stuff. I was in pain. Mentally, I was not thinking enough about what was going on around me because of what was going on inside of me. Had any constituent before this that had proposed any of the, all of the things you're so proud of in this community ever offered you money before? Yeah. I mean, was this common? No, and I will tell you, as an alderman, been alderman 19 several times, I have had meetings with people and they have said, man, I just think you're a great guy and if you can just help me out with this and I would be like, no, I'd be more than happy to help you. You don't have to do that. I, I'll do whatever you want me to do above and beyond, whatever's legal. So it's not like it hadn't happened before, but I'm not in the fright. And I'm like, you stupid. What, why, why wasn't you thinking? Because I was thinking more about what I'm going through and just checking the box when people ask me to do something. Just do it. And I screwed up and, and, and took it, just not thinking. It's bribery. And when you think about bribery and how... Over the years, you watch it on TV, you hear about things like this. Generally, someone, a politician would say, hey, look, I'll do this for you, but this is what I need after I do it. There was never a pre-conversation. There was never a post-conversation. Hey, now that I've done this for you, here's what I want. Nowhere is there evidence of that happening at all. This guy made sure, and I didn't even notice it at the time when he was saying about this is for the LRA and this is for this. 
I did, that just went over my head. I was just focused on the fact, man, this guy's helped me out in my car business. He know I'm struggling and I really appreciate him. That's where my head was. Just not thinking, this guy's being so nice to me. Why would I think he's setting me up for anything? I mean, he's helping me with my car business. One of the things um, that you and I have talked about before, but is the FBI talked about how they weren't setting anybody up. They had evidence to believe that you and the others were predisposed to this type of behavior, and that's why they targeted you all. What kind of evidence is there that would give them the idea that you would be a target in this investigation? I'm going to flat out say I don't think that's accurate. I have never in my life given people a reason. Now, people can say it, but you say what you want to. I know for a fact I have been investigated by the FBI at least a couple of times. And you know how I know? Because people came back and said it. And they were disgusted about it because they couldn't believe somebody, they were coming to them asking them that because they know who I am. And the FBI never found any wrongdoing. But when I read through this indictment and everything, and it says all the money that that guy gave me was FBI money, that kind of sickens me and that kind of hurts because I just thought I was doing what I would normally do for somebody that would come to me for a letter of support and some tax abatement. I didn't know anything about John getting paid to bring him to me. I didn't know anything about Lewis. I, John and Lewis surprised, especially Lewis, on the day we were indicted. I, I had no clue. And then I read and it says I was part of a criminal enterprise. How? There is no audio, and I challenge the government to prove me wrong, of me, Lewis, and John in a room talking about how to hustle somebody. It doesn't exist. And if it do exist, they made it up. And I put my hand on a Bible to God that that does not exist where Jeffrey Boyd is involved with that. So I'm like, how am I part of a criminal enterprise? And I was just doing my job. And there was no communications about the co-defendants. I, I was surprised that I, we're listed as co-defendants because what happened to me was just me and him. And John and I never, ever had a conversation afterwards about him. God, I wish he had said, hey, you know, I asked this guy to do this for you. And I would have been like, what? And I would have made sure I stayed away. But, <laughs> What did you do with the money? How did you spend the money he gave you? I spent the money uh, on some car repairs. Um, and I spent some money on just trivial things. So, I mean, I took the money, I had the money. You know, there's no doubt about that. I, I don't disagree with that. What I disagree with, though, is how much money it was. Because I'm told I took $2,500 the first time I met him. And I don't remember that. And, but when the FBI sat down with me, one of them clearly said, quote, unquote, stop the bullshit. We know he gave you $2,500 because we heard him and John on the phone. John asked him, did he put the money in the envelope? And he said, no, he gave you cash in hand. And I was like, well, that's what you say. I just don't remember. I just wish somebody would help me remember. I asked my lawyer to get the you know, to get the tape, uh, you know, from the phone conversation. And I was told it didn't exist. So I'm like, to this day, nobody has proved to me that he gave me money, except it says in the indictment that John saw him give it to me, which is a lie. Because when John walked in my place, John immediately went on the other side of the building. And he never sat there, the three of us never we're together discussing anything about LRA property. And when this man handed you that envelope. He did not. I don't remember that. It's what I'm saying. I'm asking somebody to show me the proof. But when he offered you the money. Oh, when he, at his office. So right. that's the so first time I recollect. It was cash. Right. So when he offered you the money, what were you thinking? 
I was thinking he's just helping me out with the car business and just being nice. You know, I never thought, uh, again, that it was like a bribe. I just didn't think about that. And no other constituents had done this before. It, they give you money after something that you've done for them. Nah, not that, not that I can remember. Not that I can remember. I mean, but there is, you know, people that I've been friends with over time that, you know, give me money for my birthday or Christmas or different things like that, you know, and it's just us being friends. And so I kind of took it as that's just us being friends. You know, he's helping me out. But it was wrong. And I regret it. But it was not intentional. And what I want people to understand, it was not intentional. I never asked a man for a dime. And had I been in right, my right frame of mind, it just would have never happened. Because you refused it before. I have refused it several times before in my career. So you've been offered, and that was, you know. But that was up front. That was like, you know, I'll take care of you kind of stuff like that. But I knew what they were doing. See, here, it happened in a real slick way. I did what I did, like I normally do. I'm minding my own business. I get a phone call, hey, my brother. If, if, when I hear somebody say, my brother, I get sick. He called me down, and I'm like, OK, you want to talk about some plans for the property or something like that? And then he offered me money, and then I took it, You know, just, just thinking he'd been a friend. And it got me where I am. But people can say it wasn't a setup all they want to. That was an absolute setup. There is no evidence out there that Jeffrey Boyd has ever hustled anybody. Because if it was, you wouldn't bring somebody that you indicted five years ago to hustle me. See. I got hustled. I got hustled so that he can get a lighter sentence. And I think people are really forgetting about the big picture. See, we as this little, we, we the small fry politicians, you know, catch us up in something like that and it becomes a high profile big to do. But you're missing this big picture over here where this guy was a drug dealer money launderer, um, about six, five or six counts on him of stuff that they know that they did. This guy was prepared to build a factory, basically, to produce synthetic marijuana poison and sell it to black people. And he was indicted in May of 2017. And our government have allowed him to walk the streets, buy pro. Why was he even allowed to buy property after that? He should have never been building a gas station. But you know why? I can't confirm this, but the street talks. He was promised probation for what he did to us. But he didn't get it. Now he's on appeal. And he's still out walking away. In the end of January, Jeffrey Boyd, Lewis Reed, John Collins Muhammad will all be sitting in jail. What kind of justice is that? How do you even justify something like that? If you're going to, typically, when people are involved in a criminal enterprise, and if you want to know what a criminal enterprise looks like on paper, I encourage everybody. Read their indictment. Read the indictment on Mohammed al -Mucha. That is a textbook story. That's a movie on a criminal enterprise. What happened to me, John, we were pulled in. We, it was an enterprise created for us, to shame us, to make it look like we're these petty, uh, on-the-take politicians. I can't speak for John. And I can't speak for Lewis. I'm not a petty politician. I've never have been. I've despised him. I have been honorable. I have served my country for 23 years with honor. After what happened to me in the military, I made staff sergeant in 48 months. It was unheard of. 
and I did it so that I didn't have to deal with the type of assault of, from anybody ever again. I'm proud of my service to my country. I've given since I was 18 year old, I have served, served, served. My value system is service. And I do it from a heart. I do it from, with passion and compassion for people. I am not who's in that indictment. That's Jeffrey Boyd not being himself. I regret what happened to me in the military that triggered me to go to counseling and experience alcohol addiction. See, nobody knows that story, but the courts do, and they didn't care. They didn't care. And when I look at what happens to black politicians in this region compared to white politicians, there's a disparity. There is a disparity in punishment. But you know what? This will not define me, Christine. This will not define who Jeffrey Boyd is. Jeffrey Boyd know who he is. Jeffrey Boyd is a loving father of three beautiful children that are all doing well. Jeffrey Boyd is a husband of a wife I call St. Patrice because she has stayed with me for 34 years, knowing that sometime I'm a booger bear. But she has a servant's heart being a registered nurse and doing, doing hospice care and home health. And I'm a son. One of the things I've always told my children, doesn't matter what you do in life, just try to make your mom and dad proud. Just try to make us proud. We'll always be there for you. And all my life, <sighs> I've always wanted to make my mama proud of me. And I think I let her down. And I'm sorry for that. I let my kids down. And I'm sorry for that. I let my constituents down that believed in me, that elected me, elected me, and re-elected me five times. I've let all my supporters down who have been with me, who have defended me against the garbage that people have said about me. I'm sorry for that. Jeffrey wasn't the Jeffrey that people know me to be. And all I can promise everybody is when this is behind me, I will do better. Be better. Have you thought about once this is behind you, beyond prison, sure. will you be back in St. Louis politics? I can't say that I will be back in St. Louis politics. I mean, I, I know I would not run for office again, but if I can help somebody, I might be willing to help somebody, but I no longer have any desire to be in public office. As a matter of fact, I wasn't planning to run again. Unfortunately, you know, I couldn't get out with a clean record, but I've done good for 19 years. I've done good. Um, I built this business here, you know, where we are the best place. And this was a dilapidated, crumbling building, like a lot of buildings on MLK. I struggled to get developers to come in my neighborhood and see the vision that I had for the community and what I knew that the community kind of wanted in this neighborhood, especially on Martin Luther King. But I kept it kept going on deaf ears. So I said, you know what, Jeffrey? One thing you learned about the Army is walk the walk and talk the talk. And so we have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in this once crumbling building. And I'm proud of that. In spite of the naysayers, 
in spite of my haters that have motivated me for a long time, that have criticized me for getting facade money, which the federal government approved to help fix this building, $40,000. People made it a big deal. Instead of celebrating what my wife and I have done, they'd rather tear us down. Nobody else is making private investments. Nobody gave me money for except the forty thousand dollars. I mean, this is sweat equity, you know, m money from working. By the way, everybody, my wife has a job as well as I did, you know. So we have combined income. We have real estate. We have passive income. We have put so much in this community. Not because we're trying to get rich, because we love our community. We provide affordable housing. We now provide a nice space for people to come and have whatever celebration that they want to have, whether it's a repast or a birthday or pastoral anniversary. And when people come in here, Christine, they're in awe. They're like, wow, I didn't expect this. Because when they call on the telephone and you say Martin Luther King and Goodfellow, anxiety builds up until you get here. And we've been fortunate. This is a very quality place and safe place for people to have an event. And we are proud of that. And nobody can take that away from me. I've earned it. I've worked hard for it. And we, me and my wife and my children are proud of this because this has been run by me, my wife, and my daughter, Brittany. And when I leave, I know things are going to move forward and we're going to do even better because I've set the blueprint in place for us to do better. And I know there's still a lot of people out there who believe in Jeffrey Boyd and who's going to have my family back when I'm gone. I know that and I feel comfortable with that. And while I'm away, I will have a lot of time to really think and reflect on what people did to me, what I've done for people, and how I can use all this experience to be a better person. I can focus on what I need to do to grow my business. When I get out, I'll be over 60 years old. Getting my retirement from the military, I will be basically retired when I get out. I'm not going to be demanded to work a job. If I do, I'm working for myself. Because that's what I set in place. And I'm proud of that too, matter of fact. I'm proud of the fact that I've done right by a lot of people. And a lot of people have been good to me. A lot of people have been good to me. And that's what hurts so bad sometimes, Christine. I've let a lot of people down being hoodwinked by a criminal, by somebody who should be in jail today, but is walking the streets and allowing to live his life. And I think there's some irony in the fact that these guys who really served and made some mistakes, because neither one of us are perfect. But I don't want people to forget all the good things John Collins Muhammad did for his community. I don't want them to forget all the good things Lewis Reed did for his community. Please don't forget all the good things I did for my community. And don't allow this to define who I am in your mind. Because this is not something I feel like Jeffrey deliberately, intentionally did. I got caught up and shame on me. But you know what? It's like if you're on drugs, you do things that you would probably say I would never do. Because you're an influence of drugs. Alcohol is nearly the same thing. You do things that you otherwise would not have done. You're more conscious about what you're doing. Christine, I'm still in pain about what has happened to me. 
with PTSD. I am 70% disabled at a minimum as a disabled veteran behind what happened to me. And God, I just wish this system would have been just a little kinder because I didn't ask for this. It all boils down to, yeah, but you took the money. And you were stupid to come up with that insurance scheme. I own that. I own that. I just wasn't thinking. And I'm sorry again for that. You uh, were among some of the loudest voices of opposition to the Jones administration's policies and culture. Um, now that that is gone, um, what are your thoughts about the future of St. Louis? I mean, like I said, you were one of the loudest voices of opposition to this administration, this current administration. And now that that is gone, what are some of your thoughts for the future of St. Louis? Wow, good question. Um, I don't want people to think that I was a protagonist in any way, that I was just mean-spirited and just wanted confrontation with the Jones administration. I want, number one, people to understand I root for this administration to be successful because if they're successful, St. Louis is successful. But there's a way of doing everything. My biggest problem with the administration was hypocrisy. We want transparency, but you're not that transparent. And these so-called progressives, in my mind, are not progressive. I worry about the future of the city of St. Louis because a lot of the so-called progressive people are hypocrites. In what way? Well, first of all, when you look at anything I have done that they viewed, it, I'm gonna give you a classic example. Do you remember when I visited the justice, well, the work, um, no, the workhouse. Do you remember when I went to the workhouse? Oh my God, Twitter lit up. They talked about how irresponsible I was. They talked about all this stuff. There's COVID going on, blah, 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 blah. But I had a mask on, right? I went there and I was live on Zoom saying I'm here. And the progressive just erupted with all this nonsense about how just not thinking and just putting people in danger. But they were really afraid of is I had proof, the receipts, they call it, of the fact that you could almost eat off the floor in the hallway at the workhouse. That place was spotless. I didn't see any mold. I didn't see roaches. I didn't see mice. I didn't see filth, which is what they said. Now, when the new mayor came in office, she, the congresswoman, the, all kind of people did a tour in like, I think April or something like that. But Jeffrey Boyd just happened to go there in January. What happened between January and April or May? They weren't called out for being irresponsible. Wasn't COVID still going on then? Yeah, it was. But they weren't called out. But people pay attention. They talk out of both sides. And you just can't always have it both ways. Um, my position with the federal aid money was half of it should go to North St. Louis, period. North St. Louis have suffered the most. Yeah, I know South St. Louis is suffering too. But we've suffered the most. So if you're going to incentivize somebody, start with the ones that have suffered the most. And even to this day, south of 40, there's more development than in North St. Louis. What is wrong with North St. Louis getting $250 million? I don't support giving away free money, $500 checks. You know, I posed it the first round. First of all, there's no equitable way of distributing those funds. 
And these same people talk about equality and equity and all this, these you know, buzzwords all the time. Why didn't my mama qualify for $500 for the next 18 months? Why didn't some, my neighbor next door qualify for some of that money? Was there a lottery? You had to hit the lottery? That's not a fair system. And it's an enabling system. We must stop enabling people. It's okay to give help, but why not make them earn it? $10 million, you look out this window, see all these vacant lots and vacant houses, easily in the Wells Goodfellow neighborhood between Martin Luther King and St. Louis Avenue, Union to the city limits. You could put $10,000 over there, build some quality homes for low to moderate income people, and let them use that money mm -hmm. to go toward their mortgage. See, that's empowerment. That's how you empower people. But if I give you free stuff, you'll probably really like me. People just say, Jeffrey, you're too hard, you know? And I tell people, I am not gonna stand out on Monarchy and Goodfellow every Friday giving away popsicles. That's not helping anybody. There's an old proverb, they say, teach a man how to, f give a man a fish, he'll live for a day, but if you teach a man how to fish, he can live for the rest of his life. That is what we should be focusing on. How do we actually help people get out of poverty? Not to incentivize them to stay in poverty. And of course, let me tell you, I know you can give 500 people all this money and you can at least find 10 that really, really needed it. But I guarantee you I could find half that probably didn't need it. And guess what? If you never gave it to them, they weren't going to pass away. They would find another way. Mm -hmm. See, when I was growing up in this neighborhood, we needed assistance during a certain period of time until my mom went back to work. The system was so horrible to black people that a social worker literally came to the house on a regular basis and took a flashlight and went under the bed to see if men's shoes was there. If they look in the closet, if a man's uh, clothes were in the closet. It was so demeaning. But it also said, black man, get out the house. We'll take care of your family. That's the government. That in TANF, temporary aid for needy families, is good for, te it's temporary. It should not be a lifestyle. How do we create programs with this money that truly enables people to build? to be able to qualify for their own home, to be able to start their own business. Now, I think we're moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. I hear about the, I read something about the, the, the Empowerment Center at, at old Beaumont, uh, I think it's Beaumont High School. Was it Beaumont? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so hopefully that's gonna be a catalyst to create a lot of entrepreneurs. I hope so. Okay. And I will look forward to seeing the data to support that. You know, but I'm really afraid of the direction we're going into right now. I have a lot of trepidation about St. Louis over the next several years, but I'll stay hopeful. All right. Is there anything else you want to add? I think we covered it pretty well. Oh, I think we've covered it pretty well, too. Oh, yeah. Well, you did a great job. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your honesty, thank you for your time, and thank you for answering the questions. That's always been me. <laughs> I've never run away from a reporter. <laughs> I can choose not to talk, <laughs> but when I do talk, I'm going to give it to you straight.